Hi! I have to preface this video with a very important disclaimer. I know next to nothing about Counter-Strike. Heck, my favorite game in the series is Counter-Strike Source, and my favorite game mode is Danger Zone. Damn it. Nice. Oh! Oh! oh you did it! I did it. <laughs> yeah. So if you're expecting any deep, complex insight into the fundamental mechanics of the game, go watch uh, Three Clicks Philip or something. These are the ramblings of a noob who is very much not lead and gets pwned a lot. I'm entirely too impatient and will rush in without a plan. I don't know anything about strategies and will just blindly follow whoever's in front. I will buy the guns that look and sound the coolest and could not control my weapon spray if my life depended on it, which it does. And I've probably watched more videos on the games than I ever spent minutes playing them. And yet, the concept of Counter-Strike simply fascinates me. This applies to all the titles, like 1.6, Source, Global Offensive, even Condition Zero. So when I use the term Counter-Strike, I'm talking about the general game structure of all of them. And in all my years, I've made some observations, things I haven't seen in other games. There are foundational mechanics in the game which are so intricately designed that all the pieces work together like clockwork. To be more specific, Counter-Strike simplicity lends itself to some of the most complex gameplay seen in games. So join me, why don't you, in my ramblings about a game I never play because I don't like it, but which simultaneously fascinates me to no end. Also, important news, I have recently updated my Patreon tiers. I'll link a video to a summary below, but basically for just one buck a month, you now get access to new videos one week earlier and you get your name in the credits. For more information, watch the video or check out my Patreon, both linked in the description and comments. Anyway, on to the actual topic. At its core, Counter-Strike is hardly anything too special, not having any major gimmicks or gameplay mechanics that really make it stand out against other shooters. There are no mechs or vehicles, no killstreak rewards like airstrikes or nukes, and even if unlockable skins might suggest otherwise, no heroes with their own unique abilities. Even the game's rules are blindingly simple. You have Team A versus Team B, with A having to engage with the objective and B defending it. Both teams can buy the same weapons and items, and they get the money for it by defeating enemies or successfully engaging with or defending the objective. If a player dies, they're out and have to wait for the next round. It's basically every single school playground game merged into one, just replace money with points. But there's a reason those children's games are still being played to this day, because they're easy to understand, but difficult to perfect. The same applies to this game. Counter-Strike does something I touched up on in my Hotline Miami video. It treats everyone equally. Every player has the same health, the same access to the same utilities, the same single life for each round. This makes it incredibly easy to get behind even for a first-time player. But at the same time, Counter-Strike takes these limitations and turns them into something way larger and way more complex. A game of taking risks. Every mechanic, every action you do and every step you take are about correctly evaluating the situation, estimating the best possible response and successfully implementing your theory. To elaborate, let's take a look at one of such mechanics, the single life. Permadeath in games always means one thing. You have to play carefully and strategically. You can't just throw yourself at the brick wall until it eventually cracks by reverting back to an earlier state like you can in Hotline Miami for instance, even though you die just as quickly in Counter-Strike as you do in that game. No, you have one chance and if you don't take advantage of it, you risk multiple things. The first is obvious, which is getting bored since you have to wait out the round. Seems superfluous to point out, but considering we play games for fun, it directly attacks your monkey brain by robbing it of those sweet, sweet dopamines. The second risk, however, is that your team is now a player short, since your actions can't influence the game directly anymore. This calls your own victory into question, because with a team lacking one-fifth of firepower, it's slightly less likely for everyone else to pick up the slack. But this doesn't just influence the actions for the current round either. Yes, you could have totally taken out that guy Banana, you just had lag. But to make matters worse, you gave that player money as a reward for killing you. And that income affects the next round, giving them a higher chance of buying weapons and items. Simultaneously, your own chance of getting money for kills is destroyed entirely, again negatively impacting the next round. Now, that money isn't just awarded via kills, of course. Instead, you also get paid for displaying a good performance via planting the bomb, defusing the bomb, rescuing a hostage and of course winning the round. This means that the player is always incentivized to do something. Anything is better than doing nothing at all, because it affects the subsequent match. 
Yes, you could simply try to hide when your team is dead, just stalling time to avoid giving the enemy a victory by shooting her down. But the enemy team isn't gonna do the same, they're going to engage with their objective, and the less time you spend trying to stop them from doing that, the higher the chance is of them winning regardless. So you have to gauge if you want to risk revealing yourself to potentially prevent their victory, or stay hidden and eventually guarantee it. Depending on your performance then, you get rewarded with money to spend on weapons in the next round. More expensive weapons are obviously more effective, but it's not necessarily the best option to buy the best guns. A sniper rifle like the Orb costs a fortune and will instantly kill just about any enemy, but if you suck at aiming, it's worth less to you than a medium range weapon. And should you die with it, you risk giving it to the enemy, again increasing their chances of success. So we have to decide if it's a better choice to buy the expensive rifles, or rather the cheaper, less effective ones to save up on money and not give your enemy the upper hand on defeat. You could also purchase armor, which obviously reduces the amount of damage you take. But would you rather improve your chances of survival by buying it, or save that money for a better gun and hope you can fire it faster than the enemy theirs? Let's also not forget that weapons can be picked up, like I alluded to earlier. So no matter how much money you have, you could simply buy a cheap one and hope to find a better one later on, getting both equipment and money. Your teammates can also drop weapons for you, but then they'd also have to consider whether spending money for you is a good investment, or if they'd be better off clinging to their cash instead. That's why I always drop my orb when I get my hands on one, because I will not be messing with that. And speaking of the weapons themselves, they also come pre-packaged with their own risks. Certain weapons are only useful at close range, others at medium, even long range. So do you rather get a close range shotgun and risk your own life taking out enemies, or do you buy a long range rifle and risk missing a lot of shots because the target is too far away? You also can't forget that guns have different spread patterns, meaning you might miss shots if you aren't familiar with them. Not even mentioning the dynamic that goes into where you hit enemies. Headshots obviously do the most damage, but are way more difficult to achieve than simply aiming for the chest, which does less damage. So do you go for high risk, high damage, or low risk, low damage? Let's now take a look at the other items you can buy, namely grenades. They're mostly insanely straightforward, as is to be expected from this game. A grenade explodes and damages anyone nearby. A Molotov cocktail or incendiary grenade damages anyone in an area over time. A flashbang briefly blinds enemies. And a decoy grenade plays random noises to confuse them. There's already a lot of risk involved here, since buying one of each would be too expensive, so you have to pick ones you think would work best for the situation at hand. Do you want to buy grenades to flush enemies out, but risk not hitting anyone? Maybe buy an incendiary instead, to prevent enemies from proceeding through an area. But you might have to walk there yourself, or the fire might get extinguished via a smoke grenade. A flashbang is incredibly useful, but you're at risk of blinding yourself if you're not careful, or the enemy is prepared and looks away in time, ruining your surprise. Or maybe you'll get a decoy grenade and guarantee wasting your money, because who honestly falls for these anymore? Not even I do. The one grenade type I think offers the most interesting and complex mechanics has got to be the smoke grenade. I really used to hate them because I never fully understood their true purpose. All a smoke grenade does is obscure vision. That's the entire point of it, which is why I always found it so lame. Why would I want to mildly inconvenience the enemy if I could set them on fire or just shoot them in the face? And yet, it does so much more. When you throw a smoke grenade down a choke point or hallway, you create a sort of wall. Now, I think you'll find this exciting. This is actually a wall that you can walk through. However, doing so isn't the best of ideas, because you're going to go into it completely blind. Sure, the enemy might not know where you are inside the smoke or if you're even walking through it, but they will find out as soon as you pass through. And who is more likely to hit their target? Someone who is stumbling through a dark cloud and who has no idea how many people are lurking on the other side and certainly not where, or someone who has been watching said cloud the entire time? Do you feel brave enough to take that risk? So it's a way to discourage players from taking certain routes. But you can also use it to conceal your own path by throwing it down passages that you suspect enemies might be keeping an eye on. And yet it doesn't offer protection, as bullets don't necessarily care whether or not they can see. So you have to rely on the hope that your enemy doesn't randomly hit you when shooting into your smoke as you're running past. It's made worse by the fact that you're essentially giving your position away when throwing a smoke, by announcing, Hello enemy team, I will attempt to walk past this hallway in the foreseeable future, please refrain from firing upon my buttocks. At the same time though, the enemy will also give their position away as well, should they decide to ignore your pleas and shoot you. So they also have to decide if they should risk telling on themselves to potentially plant a bullet in your head. It's all mind games and that's exactly what makes the smoke grenade so exciting. It's a constant game of bluffing and risking. You can even fake grenade throws by pretending to chuck a flashbang, hoping the enemy doesn't realize it's actually a decoy and looks away, and then rush in to kill them. 
even the act of throwing grenades in the first place is a game of risk. There are ultra precise setups for grenades, where you have to aim at incredibly obscure pieces of level geometry in order to get them to land exactly where you want while staying at a safe distance. So you could learn all those strategies and try to implement them properly, or avoid the chance of messing up by getting closer to the enemy and risk getting attacked instead. All of these mechanics turn Counter-Strike into a game about psychology, of trying to outsmart your opponent by mixing a whole heap of bluffs and hopes into a pot and adding a little bit of skill and luck. Now, I hear a lot of people say that randomness has no place in competitive games, like the War Owl. Randomness is a really annoying addition to a skill-based shooter. This ain't no card game, we're not calculating the odds here. In FPS, the better player is the one who clicks on the other guy first, using skill and cunning. But I vehemently disagree with that statement. I think it absolutely devalues the true intricacies of Counter-Strike by boiling it down to a Twitch shooter. If it was truly just about shooting, then the only available weapon would be the railgun from Quake, with no way or even need to buy anything else. But the game isn't like that. It already is about randomness, whether you like it or not. It's an interplay of evaluating the situation, estimating potential outcomes and implementing your own strategy. Yes, your own skill is always going to be immensely important, but it doesn't matter how fast you shoot or how well you can throw a nade if you are in the wrong place at the wrong time. But you can't ever be 100% certain where you should be. You can only rely on your experience and your gut. And when you fire upon an enemy, it's not just about correctly aiming at them. You have to keep in mind where you're standing in relation to them, since being too far away reduces your chances of hitting, but being too close increases their chances instead. You also have to be aware of how you approach them, since running will mess up your aim, but walking and especially standing still makes you a far easier target. Guns are also not perfectly accurate in general, meaning that even if your crosshair perfectly lines up with your opponent's noggin, it might just miss the mark. It's all a big calculation you have to do in your head, estimating which possible route has the best chances of success. And it's always just a chance, never a guarantee. Even the fact that players spawn in randomized locations forces them to come up with a new strategy on the spot instead of merely relying on memorizing the same patterns each round. Part of being a competitive player shouldn't just be to simply remember everything and spout it out like they are studying for an American exam. It should also involve being able to adapt to sudden changes and restructure the plans accordingly, using their skills more as different tools for different situations rather than as the be-all and end-all solution. And this is truly put to the test by the fact that everything I just talked about also applies to the enemy team. They too spawn randomly and have to decide on the spot which route to take and which strategy to implement. You can't even know which weapons and items they'll buy, you can only guesstimate based on the amount of money you think they might have. And even then, maybe they'll save their cash, maybe they'll blow it all on giving one member a powerful arsenal, while the rest rolls out with pea shooters. All of these decisions are ones you're completely unaware of, ones you'll only see the outcome of when they personally affect you. And since you can't exactly prepare for something you don't know will even happen, you have to take risks. And one game mode truly encapsulates that risk taking the most. Bomb defusal. While I believe it lacks character compared to something like Hostage Rescue, even not having the best map in the entire game, CS Office, it's the most popular and likely the best and most well-balanced game mode in Counter-Strike's history. Much like the rest of the game, the setup is insanely simple. There are two bomb sites, Terrorist Plant Bomb, Counter Terrorist Diffuse Bomb. Counter-terrorists might have it easy because they merely have to defend the bomb sites and can simply remain in one spot while waiting for the action to come to them. That example I described earlier when it comes to smoke grenades, that's essentially what CTs do every round. Terrorists have no idea where the CTs might be waiting. They can only guess based on their knowledge of where the best hiding spots might be. And even then, they can't know how many of them there are, if any at all. However, terrorists have the upper hand when it comes to deciding where to plant the bomb, whether it's on site A or site B. So they can decide to either split up between the sites to cover more ground, or rush B as a group to ensure survival. The counter-terrorists then have to decide if they also want to put all their eggs in one basket, or instead rotate between the sites, risking being caught off guard. And whether to split up or not might be an easy decision to make, were it not for the fact that teams only have 5 players, meaning one side will always have fewer members than the other. The decision is then how to efficiently divide up your firepower. I also find the dynamic between the two teams remarkably fascinating. At first, counter-terrorists are defending and terrorists attack, with both factions not knowing where the other one might be. 
Once the bomb has been planted, however, the terrorists try to defend it, while the counter-terrorists rush in to stop them. It completely mixes up their roles, something I haven't seen much myself in other team shooters. This is of course also present in other game modes like Hostage Rescue, but the act of planting the bomb adds even more risk-taking. Tees have to decide where the best spot for the bomb is, not just so it's hidden from the CTs, but also so they're not completely exposed when setting it up. CTs don't know the location of the explosive, so not only do they have to find it, they also have to risk defusing it while the terrorists are still alive, or take them out first and risk not being able to disarm the bomb in time. Here's where yet another item to buy comes into play, the defuse kit. Counter-terrorists have to decide if it's a good investment to get one and be able to defuse the bomb faster, because they might never even reach that point in the first place, wasting their money. Not buying one in favor of stronger weapons then opens up the possibility of taking out the terrorists easier, but also not having enough time to defuse the bomb as well. There are so many, many, many more aspects in the game which offer up risk versus reward decisions to make. So many, in fact, that they could each be their own video in themselves. Like the role sound plays. Running to a location gets the player there faster, but also gives away their position. Sneaking allows for them to move stealthily, but might also waste precious seconds. Or how much map design can influence the entire flow of a level, to the point where even the direction that a door is facing can make or break matches. Or even just the fact that shooting also affects your own teammates, meaning every time you fire a shot, you're at risk of harming your own partners. But just to summarize, Counter-Strike is an incredibly simple game. But that simplicity allows for an immense amount of complexity. I know the comparison is overdone, but it's kind of like chess in that regard. Everyone has the same pieces with different functions, but it's about how and when you use them. And you're still required to analyze your opponent's moves and assume how they're going to act, and then do your own moves accordingly. It's no secret that the games that age the best are the simplest ones, because even 10, 20, 100 years down the line, new players will still be able to instantly understand them. And it's much harder for certain mechanics to age poorly if there simply aren't as many. Case in point, you can still play Counter-Strike 1.6 and have a good time, even if the game was released over 20 years ago. You couldn't really do the same with something like Team Fortress Classic, something that was outdated even before the sequel at the scene. But Counter-Strike remains, even amongst all kinds of other shooters like Call of Duty and Battlefield that, on the surface, are basically the same game, yet follow different patterns. Because unlike them, Counter-Strike is a game about taking risks based on game knowledge, mechanical skills and team synergy. If it was purely about simply shooting dudes with cool guns, it would have never stood the test of time or even just stood out compared to other games. By using the few mechanics it has, Counter-Strike creates a very rich and complex experience. And even if they're so simple, they're all connected. If weapons couldn't be picked up, you'd ruin the decision making when it comes to purchasing them. And if you remove the smoke grenade, it would harm strategies regarding which objectives to attack, since you couldn't conceal your position and team numbers as well anymore. The War Owl proves this the best with this Counter-Strike mutation series. Mess with just one aspect and it throws everything off. Can shoot through all walls, Negev becomes meta. Everyone has a thousand HP, Negev becomes meta. Guns only have one magazine, Negev, no, the M249 becomes meta. But this delicate balance of all these simple mechanics really does create unique, interesting and most importantly, complex gameplay. And all it took was taking a little bit of risk. Anyway, what's your opinion on this? I can't wait for the Counter-Strike pros to flood in and point out how every single thing I said was wrong. But I don't really care. These were my thoughts on the game, how I see and understand it. But if you have more to add, please tell me in the comments. And as always, please also consider liking, subscribing and perhaps even supporting me on Patreon, considering the new tiers and all. But for now, thank you very much for watching, have a wonderful day and goodbye.